besides that, welcome. Thank you everybody for joining uh, Derby City Agile Meetup. Um, as you see on the screen, we have the one, the only, the lovely Chet Hendrickson uh, here today. I'll let uh, Anna and, and Steve uh, give a little more intro there. Uh, I do wanna thank the Hardin County IT um, Meetup Group for co-hosting this. Uh, Steve Hackett will, will talk here shortly as well. Um, have a couple of announcements uh, for the Agile community uh, that, that we're gonna have coming up. <clears throat> Conference coming up. We're thinking about doing our first in-person meetup um, as well, beginning of next year. So Anna can uh, sort of uh, expand on that, but I wanna thank everybody joining. Uh, I'm gonna let Anna take it away uh, and rock and roll. Hi everybody, I'm Anna Kepshire. I own KEP Training and we have some exciting classes with Chet coming up. We have a CSM, a CSPO and an ACSM. So I'll put that in the Dropbox. And I'm gonna let um, Steve actually take it from here. Steve is with Jack Henry and this idea was all his. So I thought we'd let him um, kind of run with, you know, why this was important and then we'll hand it off to the one and only amazing Chet Hendrickson. Absolutely, thanks, Anna, really appreciate that. Or girl boss as your uh, <laughs> Zoom handle is, which I know is always fun. Um, Hey, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning if you're in an earlier time zone. Uh, my name is Steve Hackett. I work at Jack Henry. I'm a software engineer, senior manager here, um, uh, responsible for our engineering team and also our product design team. And I want to welcome everybody to this session, um, the Derby City Agile folks and also uh, our friends down here in Hardin County, Kentucky, with the IT professionals group. And just a quick heads up, we are looking at some potential uh, just like uh, Anna was saying with uh, Derby, or Jay was saying with Derby City, looking at some uh, in-person opportunities uh, as long as everything stays kind of status quo right now. So be on the lookout for that. Have some announcements there. Um, and Chet, thanks for, for speaking today. Really appreciate it, um, especially with this topic, which is really near and dear to, I'm sure, everybody's heart, but definitely for our heart here at Jack Henry. Um, tech debt, right? It's one of those things, uh, you know, our system is it just creeped over the 20 year uh, age mark. It's almost old enough to drink. And uh, with that, you can imagine there's a lot of tech debt that comes with that. Um, and so we're, we're figuring out what's the best way to navigate that. And, and a, a tough thing for a lot of organizations when it comes to tech debt is finding your footing because it is a very, very expansive topic and there's a lot of different philosophies on how to appropriately handle tech debt, how to categorize it, how to prioritize it when it's a lot of times invisible to the decision makers of what gets prioritized in the product roadmap. So um, hopefully we walk away here with some great information. I'm sure Chet's going to do a wonderful job sharing what are some best practices, what are some ideas, what are some things to uh, consider when it comes to attacking tech debt. And um, definitely put your questions into the chat here. We're going to wait until Chet finishes up and then we'll turn it into the Q&A. But at any point, feel free to drop those questions in here and we will attack that at the latter part of the presentation. But uh, without further ado, Chet, I'll hand it over to you. And again, thanks for uh, taking the time to share some great information with us today. Well, uh, happy to do it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have some slides. Are you guys getting them? Can you see what I have on my screen here? OK. Yep. Uh, first of all, I made up a cutesy name. You know what's what's your coach credit score because I thought that was I thought that was cutesy enough, but uh, I want to start first of all by talking a little bit about what does technical debt mean. Uh, and over the years, there have been a few different uh, definitions pop up, uh, uh, and so there's there's the original definition from Mord Cunningham that we'll talk about. There's what some people mean when they say it, which isn't which is what tech debt isn't, and then what most people today mean with tech debt. Uh, to start with, back, ooh, goodness gracious, probably 10 or more years ago, uh, Ward Cunningham, and if you all are not familiar with Ward Cunningham, he's somebody you should look up. Uh, Ward, among other things, uh, invented the wiki uh, and uh, a bunch of other really cool things. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot about how we know to develop software today comes from Ward, it turns out. Uh, and so Ward had this idea that we had written a program, a system, as well as we could write it. Uh, it, it's well factored, it has minimal defects, it does exactly what we want it to do. 
But however, uh, however, now that we've finished it and go back and look at what we did, we now see that we wished we had done it some other way. Uh, we used a monolithic approach and we wish you'd used microservices. We used this particular kind of persistence mechanism. We wish you to use that one. Some, some decision that we made that was appropriate at the time in retrospect, we now see was not maybe what we wish we had done. And so Ward said that the, the effort taken uh, that would take to move that system from what you had done to what you wished you had done, he called that technical debt. Uh, and it turns out that's a very interesting idea, but that's almost not what anybody means today when they say technical debt. Uh, so we always keep the original definition in your head because there's places where that is, is actually appropriate. Uh, now, there are some folks who think technical debt is we just wrote a piece of crap and now we have to figure out how to deal with that. And, and that really isn't what we mean by technical debt, at least not what I mean by technical debt. Uh, that just means we did crappy work and we shouldn't try to hide crappy work behind some cutesy name. So if you've done crappy work, stand on your hind legs and say, say we did crappy work and figure out what you wanna do about that. The, the third top definition here, I think are, are, is what most people mean when they say technical debt. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, by technical debt, we mean the cost associated with taking a system we've written to where we wish it was, not from a design standpoint, but really from an implementation standpoint. Uh, we have a system that mostly does what it's supposed to do, but it has defects that, that are bothersome. Um, the code is not so bad that you wish you'd just get thrown away in the middle of the night, but it's hard to work with. Uh, it's hard to understand, it's hard to make changes in, and, and it's just not a thing you want. And that's mostly what we mean by tech debt. Now, sometimes that happens in generation one of a system. And as, as we were hearing there a moment ago, that a system that's 20 years old probably has accumulated lots of little cruft here and there uh, where people have misunderstood what something meant or found it easier to replicate a piece of code than to, to uh, remove that duplication and abstract out some concept that now should be in there. And so what we're gonna talk about today is really that kind of technical debt. The things we wish were better uh, that maybe it's because we have let the system deteriorate over time and just haven't put enough effort in keeping it clean as we go. Uh, clean is a word we're trying to stop using. So we'll, I'll try to remember what the better word is. Uh, bright is the word we're trying to use today, bright. We're trying to keep our code bright. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about bright as we go along. Uh, in fact, we're gonna talk a little bit about bright and dull. Uh, so the terminology I prefer today is bright and dull. Uh, as a, one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto, a friend of mine uh, by the name of Brian Merrick, uh, Brian's wife, Dawn, uh, recently retired, retired a couple of years ago. She was on the uh, uh, faculty at the University of Illinois Veterinary School. Uh, Dawn is a large animal veterinarian. Uh, some of you folks there uh, uh, may have come from farm backgrounds. I've always was a little, a little city boy, even though the city only had about 1,500 people, I was a city boy. Uh, but it turns out in veterinary medicine, there is a term for assessing the health of cattle. And uh, that is bright and dull. A uh, healthy cow is bright, an uh, unhealthy cow is dull. And there's no specific rules about what makes a cow bright or dull. It's just assessed by the veterinarian standing in front of the animal. And, and it's taught in a variety of ways around the world, and yet uh, uh, veterinarians pretty much agree at a specific animal is either bright or dull. And so that's the terminology I've kind of adopted over the past few months, it turns out, uh, that bright code is good, that it doesn't need very much help. It's, it's healthy. It's healthy. But dull code isn't healthy. It needs help. And, and so we want to think a little bit about whether our code is bright or dull, what parts of it are bright or dull, and, and we'll look at the impact of that one way or another as we go along. When it comes to assessing good quality code, uh, bright code, 
Uh, I fall back to Kent Beck's four rules for good code, for what he calls four rules of simplicity. Uh, the first rule of this is it must work. Uh, if the code doesn't work, nothing else matters. Uh, and so uh, this requires us to have tests to know that it does what it's supposed to do, and all those tests run successfully. Uh, the second thing we want to look at is, is there duplication in this code? Uh, are there simple, simply you know, copied lines over here and over here, same exact lines, somebody copied it from here and put it over here? Uh, what our friend Brian Beecham refers to as copy pasta, uh, because copy pasta is how you get spaghetti code. Uh, and that turns out to be bad. So, so does it contain duplication? It turns out there's, there's more than one kind of duplication. The, the most obvious, of course, is the thing I just talked about, that these 10 lines of code here are the same 10 lines over there. And therefore, there's some idea that needs to be abstracted. Uh, but there's also what we call temporal duplication, uh, the idea that, that something is happening in our program more times than it needs to. Uh, you often see this in code uh, that is fairly tightly coupled to a relational database. If you go through and look at that kind of code, often you see where the database is read and some work happens. And then all of a sudden the database gets read again, exact same row from the database is read again. And maybe it's read again and read again because they're unsure. Uh, the people writing this program are unsure whether they have the data or not. And so they, 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 keep, they keep refreshing it to make sure they have the latest of it. Uh, that's temporal duplication. Something's happening more than once when it really didn't need to. And so you want to think about all the different kinds of duplication you might have. Uh, the third rule is, is expresses all design ideas. Uh, this is what you see violated a great deal. Uh, what we want to have in our code is not only what it does, but why it does it. Uh, Often what we see is just lines of code that do things and then you have to go along and figure it out. This is, uh, those, of the, those of you who are programmers certainly have had this experience where you have code on a screen or made more, more appropriately code printed out and you go reading through it and you circle a big chunk of it and say, okay, over here, this is where they're doing this thing. And over here is where they're doing that thing. Well, that idea should be expressed in the code explicitly. Uh, this is why you have methods with names and say what they do. Uh, this is why in uh, more traditional languages, you have chunks of code with some kind of name. Uh, in COBOL, we had paragraphs with names on them to say what it was doing. And, and someplace else would explain why it's doing it. And so, and so what we want in our code are basically layers of, of why we're doing something and then the actual doing of it that expresses what it's doing. And so you can move around and understand at the high level, what's going on, why it's doing what it's doing, and then you can see the actual implementation of it. Uh, that's very important. Uh, the fourth thing we worry about is have we minimized all the code bits we can? Have, do we have the fewest number of classes and interfaces and methods and lines of code? Make it as compact as possible. Uh, those are in order of importance. Uh, running correctly is more important than anything else. It turns out that re reducing duplication is the second most important thing. I firmly believe that duplication is the root of all evil in software. And so eliminating duplication is my primary goal. Now, that's almost true. Now, the second one is the things that were in my head should end up in the code. So people understand why I'm doing what I'm doing uh, not just the, the lines, the magic words that make it do it, but expresses my intentions. You want your intentions to show up in the code. And then I worry about reducing the footprint. Now, a moment ago, I said almost. And it turns out, depending upon what I'm working on, the number two and three of those rules will invert. Uh, on, in tests, uh, I prize expressing intention over reducing duplication. And, but in application code, duplication is my number one uh, 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 desire, my number one thing. And so in my, in my test, I want people to be able to read and understand them right there on the page. And so I will allow duplication between this test and that test in order, in order for each test to tell a complete story. 
uh, our friend Brian likes to say that you keep your production code dry. That's don't repeat yourself dry. And you want to uh, keep your test code wet, which is write explicit tests. And so you want your tests to be explicit. You want them to express the ideas, even if it does cause duplication to happen. You find which of those rules make sense to you. That's the set I like. That's how I, I like to approach it. Now, what kinds of things do you see in code when you start violating these four rules? Well, you get bugs that are hard to figure out. Uh, sometimes they're there and sometimes they aren't. Uh, that's one of the most frustrating things for us programmers, where, where something doesn't work and then it does and then it works again and you don't know what is the factor that's making it happen because computers don't work randomly. In fact, you, can, you cannot get them to work randomly. Uh, we have to fake random, it turns out, in computers. Uh, but we sometimes see things that appear to be happening, happening randomly. Uh, and sometimes you fix those things just through, through nonsensical uh, actions. Uh, years and years ago, back when I was working at, uh, where was I? Oh, I guess I was at General Motors back then. And, and we were working in a language called PL1, which was a weird language that IBM had created. And a program I inherited had in it a statement to write to the operator console. It said, in mainline. And I was told when I took it over that if you took that line out of the code, it would blow up. It would work. It would not work. You had to, so you had to leave that line in there and nobody knew why. And so you get all these weird things happen in code that's not well factored and well understood because we're afraid to make changes to it because there is, we did this once and a bad thing happened. So we're not allowed to do that anymore. And so you get these weird bugs. Uh, you find all this awful spaghetti of if statements, uh, nested maybe on and on and on. Uh, I sometimes joke that, that the tabbing, the spacing on, on conditional code uh, should use the Fibonacci sequence uh, so that the first tab in on your if statement is one tab and the second is two and then the third three and then five, and eight, and on and on and on until you finally go off the side of the screen. And that's a way of telling you you've got too much going on there. Uh, and so you get all this weird maze of repeated code that just looks all like, like, like uh, uh, you're walking through a cave and all the, uh, all the rooms look the same. Uh, you see code like that. And that's always makes the back of my, uh, uh, hair on the back of my head uh, stand up. Uh, you see weird names that make no sense. Uh, uh, little fragments of words, perhaps letters with, with no meaning to them. Uh, you see magic values that aren't explained. Why is, why is, why are, we, why are we multiplying this times four? I don't know, but we're multiplying it times four and apparently it's never gonna change. Uh, you might find places in the code where what appears to be the same sort of thing is happening, maybe within the same system in different programs, but done in different ways which is always confusing because is it done a different way here than it was done there just because the person that wrote it forgot how they did it over there or somebody new came along and they like to do it this way versus that way. And so you see these differences that have no logical reason. And, and so that's very confusing. And that increases the cost that we have in our heads of, of understanding that code and, and making changes to it later. Um, Perhaps the one that bothers me the most is, is a violation of modularity, a violation of the rules of uh, uh, cohesion, where we're working with some third party uh, a framework, uh, some third party piece of code, and how it works has infiltrated into the code uh, we are doing. Uh, any of those, uh, any of you who've ever taken any kind of programming training with me will know that I hardly ever even use a, co a collection class uh, uh, from a language without wrapping it in some domain specific code. So I can talk to it the way I want to talk to it. Uh, I'm certainly going to do that with everything of any interest. Uh, and a huge, huge improvements can be made by walling off those kinds of third party uh, uh, frameworks 
behind a shell so that you can talk how you want to talk within your program. And there's one layer which translates it to, to the uh, uh, framework you're using. That way, if you decide to change the framework, the vast majority of your code is insulated from those things. Uh, so keep it out and uh, keep it out an eye for that. Now, while I was getting ready to write this presentation up uh, over the past few days, I got an email from somebody uh, telling me that, of some research they had done around tech, tech debt. And so I have uh, incorporated that here. Let me, let's go through this because as programmers, we understand the pain that comes from having to work in a system that's hard to work with and hard to understand. Uh, but there's getting to be some research to show that this is a, a bigger problem than just making our programmers' lives a little bit more annoying. Um, and so what is the cost of this? Well, first of all, this is gonna reduce predictability. Uh, we don't know how long it will take to do things because we don't know what we'll find when we rip open the covers. Uh, it's sort of like remodeling uh, a 50 year old house. You don't know what you're gonna find until you pull off the sheetrock, pull off the plaster and find out what's in the walls and what horrors you're gonna find. Uh, and so that, that makes it hard to predict how long it's gonna take to do stuff. The one that bothers me perhaps most coming from my background in economics is this, this idea of, of this tech debt being what, what we call an externality. An externality is a, a phenomenon, uh, an economic phenomenon where the cost of one economic action uh, is borne by some other. Uh, the classic example of this is, in, uh, is pollution. Uh, if I am, if I build a factory and I throw out smoke and all kinds of stuff into the air, it'll settle on somebody else's house and they'll pay the cost of that. Uh, I won't. Uh, and so what happens when we, when we have this tech debt is that some piece of code we wrote yesterday or five or 10 years ago didn't bear all of the cost it should have. We didn't spend enough time working on it to bring it up to the quality it needed to be. And now every time something touches that, it takes more time and more effort and more cost. And so the failure to pay all the costs back here is visited on us all out into the future. Uh, this distorts the market for features because a given feature should cost the same whether you do it in iteration one or iteration 20. But if you have this technical debt, the one out if you ask for it in integration 20, it will cost way more because I'm having to repair the things that have happened in, in between. Uh, you want each action to bear its entire cost. That way the business folks can make rational decisions about what to do now and what to do later and potentially what to do never. Uh, we have to deal with this debt because it, it, it causes us to do things over and over again, perhaps. We end up with rework because of this. And that's, that's bad. And of course, it frustrates everyone. Uh, all these things add to frustration. And, and the work that we do is frustrating enough. And so, and so we wanna reduce this impact in order to make our lives better. And as I said, we have some research about this uh, that I'm, I wanna share with you. Um, I think one of the most astounding is, is that 52% of engineers believe that technical debt negatively impacts their team's performance. 52% are feeling the, the, the angst, the pain that comes from the quality of the work they're doing. Um, going along with this, which is actually the thing that, that nabbed me from this presentation, which I don't think is actually in here, but I have, I, I found, I found it. It'll come here in a minute. So 52% believe that this impacts their teams negatively. 65% of engineers report that the back end is where most of the technical debt is. Uh, and so that's really the place that we know how to test well and refactor well. Uh, that's the place we know how to do good work is in the back end. Now the front end stuff, we got that weird short to people kind of things, but the back end, we've been doing this kind of stuff for 
quite a long time, but we know how to do this. And it's just astounding that that's, that's where technical debt is, is usually found. Um, 66% believe that they could ship up to 100% faster if they had a process for dealing with technique and we're getting rid of it. 100% faster. That's, that's a huge cost to all of us. Uh, imagine, you know, that we got things we wanted 100% faster. Wouldn't that be wonderful? The, like I said, the, the, the one I think is most astounding is this one. 51% of engineers have considered leaving their jobs because of the high tech debt they are dealing with. Over half of programmers are actively thinking about leaving their job because of this. I guess it would matter whether they're the folks who are responsible for it or not. If they're the folks who are responsible for it, maybe it would be good if they left their jobs. My guess is that's not how it's working. My guess is that the 49% are actively building new uh, uh, tech debt and they're happy with how things are maybe, but that's, that's just an astounding number. You know, if, if you're gonna have a discussion with your business folks about why you should be doing things about the quality of the code you're working with, that one number is enough to give any organization significant pause because, because the cost of, of turnover, the cost of ranking, of, of finding and hiring and onboarding new developers is incredibly high. And having 51% of our developers actively thinking about changing jobs because of this, it ought to be a huge motivator. It ought to be a huge motivator for our, for our organizations. Um, and last of these is that 58% of companies have no process to deal with technical debt, uh, except I guess making it worse day after day, week after week. And so, and so in order to, to bring these effects back into control, under control, uh, we have to actively decide how we're gonna deal with this. And, and we, have, we have rules about this. Now, what kind of things cause this technical debt? One of them is lack of skill. I'm afraid, I'm, I'm really sorry to say that, but I believe the major cause the two, of the two major causes, lack of skill is incredibly significant. Uh, almost no place teaches programmers how to actually write good code. Uh, almost no place teaches programmers what good code is. Uh, 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 new developers, new engineers coming out of universities have had almost no exposure to what good object-oriented design is. Uh, they're not exposed to how to test. They're not exposed to how to refactor code. Uh, you look around at articles written about how you do stuff online today, and you see almost nothing about how to deal with problems. It's almost always written in as if whoever wrote it was creating perfect code every time. I know very few people who can do that. I certainly can't. And so, and so I always treat code as prose. Uh, it has to be edited. You have to take your idea and get it down first and then make it one that communicates to the next person who comes along. So, so we have to understand that if we're gonna deal with technical debt, we first of all have to make sure our, our employees, our engineers know what, what good quality code is and know how to create it. Know how to assess the quality of the stuff they're looking at. That becomes incredibly important. The second major factor that causes technical debt is pressure. Uh, until those skills get so ingrained into the heads, into the hands of your engineers, anytime we put them under pressure, they will fall back to working the way they worked before. Uh, you talk to 100 programmers, the vast majority of them will tell you that testing takes time and refactoring takes time. Uh, you talk to folks who, like me, have been doing this for a long time, we know that it's faster to do those things. Uh, it's, it's the smoothness that matters. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Formula One fan, and I know that the guy going around the track who looks smooth and perhaps even looks slow is often the fastest guy on the road right then because smooth is fast. Slow is fast is the saying we have. So we want to 
we want to make sure that we have given our developers the time it takes to do the work, to learn those things, keep pressure off of them so that they continue to do the right things. And it turns out we'll get there faster because of that. Now, of course, if you're dealing with a lot of technical debt already in your system, you, that makes things worse. And, and it's easier to add another piece to the pile of trash than it is to sweep it away. And so it builds up on and on like that. The, the worst thing your developers can say, the worst thing a programmer can tell their boss, tell their business partner when asked to do something is, well, we'll try. Can you get this done by Tuesday? Uh, we'll try. What they're telling you is we don't think we can, but we're afraid to say so. And the only way we have to deal with that box we've now fallen into is to turn the two big magic dials we programmers have at our disposal. Uh, both of them are quality. We first turn down the internal quality, which raises the technical debt. And then we turn down the external quality, which increases the bug count. And you don't want either one of those things. And so when, when a developer says, we'll try, you'll say, no, tell us what it would really take to get this work done, because we want it to be done at the highest quality possible. So, so pressure, incredibly, incredibly important to deal with. So what do we actively do? What do we actively do? Well, there's two rules for this. Uh, borrowed from, from a book called uh, uh, Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael Feathers. Uh, Michael came up with these two ideas. The first is the first rule of holes. Uh, the first rule of holes is rather simple. Uh, when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And so if you have technical debt today, stop making it worse. And so you got to get your engineers trained so that they know how to do good work, to recognize good design and recognize bad design and know how to take a good design to a slightly better design through refactoring. Uh, you want to reorganize your organization to put together feature teams, teams with all the skills required to build anything that needs to be built, as opposed to to uh, uh, component teams, uh, teams that now have to just do one little part and they don't understand, they don't have any visibility of the impact they have on everyone else. They just know their one little thing. Uh, it's, it's back to the way Henry Ford built cars a hundred years ago. That's not how we should be building software today. And so get rid of those component teams and disperse those people into, into feature teams. Uh, get rid of of uh, uh, shared services organizations. Uh, that's just a way of having component teams. Uh, I've been saying for quite some time now that, that shared services is the answer to the question, how can we go slower? Uh, you don't wanna go slow, you wanna go as fast as you can at the quality you need to be at. And, and these old ways of working, component teams, shared services teams don't support that. They, they work against those things. Uh, once you get your developers, your engineers thinking about what good code is, they need to come together and develop some rules for your organization. Uh, your organization should at every level have appropriate sets of standards, how to do things, coding standards. You know, and it's way more than just where the curly braces goes. It's, it's how do we deal with this kind of situation? Uh, so that when we look at code, it looks like we wrote it. And, and we develop a common style across the company so that we can bring the quality up where it needs to be and, and we understand what's happening uh, any place we look. That becomes incredibly important. So develop coding standards, develop development patterns. This is how we deal with this situation. In this, in this set of circumstances, this is what we do. Uh, there's plenty of places to, ex to express your creativity. Uh, but we should have some rules under which we run operate to, to improve our lives. Uh, do you, you wanna have creativity in a place where you can't stand and you wanna leave? Or do you wanna give up a little bit of that individuality to build a workplace where you can be happy 
and and feel like you're actually accomplishing things. Uh, decide which one's more important to you. I know who I'd want to work with though. Um, back to the we'll try. You know, one of the most basic ideas in Scrum and Agile and XP is that the folks doing the work own how the work is to be done and how much will be done. And so let's let's make sure we don't back get backed into a corner of the we'll try. We want to say, this is how much we can get done at the level of quality you need me to work at. And going any faster than that will actually slow us down in the long run because what we build will be of too low quality and we'll have to fight with it maybe from then on, okay? That's how you stop digging the hole. The next step is what do you do about it? How do you fill the hole in? And for this, we have what's called the Boy Scout rule. Uh, those of you who are Boy Scouts know that you, you always leave the campground cleaner than you found it. And so if you go stay at some campground and there's a piece of paper, a, 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 a candy wrapper on the ground, when you get there, you pick it up. It doesn't matter that you didn't throw it down. You leave the campground cleaner than you found it. And so this is how we solve this problem. A little bit at a time. A little bit of time. You don't have to paint, you don't have to wash the rocks at the campground, but you leave it a little bit better. And so that allows us to slowly work ourselves out of this debt we've created. You don't pay it off in one big chunk. You you amortize it. You you uh, uh, pay it off like the mortgage. You you pay it off a little bit at a time to get back to even. And so create a backlog. Of, of areas that need improvement and prioritize that. Now, we're not gonna work directly against that backlog. We're gonna use that to remind us of places we wanna put a little bit of effort into. And so we're only gonna do work to improve code quality when we have a legitimate reason to be there otherwise. Uh, we have been asked to make a change that causes us to go to this place. And while, we'll, while we are there, we're gonna see that this is a place we wanna spend a little bit, a little bit more time and so maybe we spend 10% more improving that code a little bit, refactoring it, improving its names, improving how it expresses what it's trying to do. Uh, if it's something that's on the top of our list, maybe we'll spend 15% more time to get a good start at it. And the idea is that places that change a lot, because that's what we have to change to put new things into our system, uh, that's where defects are. We go there a lot. Over time, it will keep, it keep getting better and better and better and no longer have much debt. Now, places we never have to change, it doesn't really matter that it's poorly factored because you don't have to look at it. And so you don't, you don't find an old abandoned campground and clean it up. You only clean up the ones you go to, okay? Um, so, so don't just think, oh, this is a place that's really bad. Let's go work on it. And so this means we, we don't work speculative. We don't, we don't have refactoring sprints because that's meaning we think something wants to change, but we don't have a reason to change it. And so don't have refactoring sprints. Don't have a refactoring team. Do it as part of your normal work. We're here. We're going to leave it a little bit better. And over time, it'll get better and better and better. You improve things the same way it got bad, a little bit every time you touch it. That's the only thing we know that works. Uh, that's my last slide. Let me see if I can figure out how to get out of here. No, I have no idea how to stop this silly thing. Anyway, thank you all very much. Um, somebody has some questions, I imagine. Are there some questions in here? Let's see, who's, has somebody been looking at this as I've been jib jibber jabbering? Yeah, yeah hey, okay. Chad. Um, we've got a couple questions in here. Um, the first one is from Vinay, and they wrote, how would you propose, oh, it just disappeared on me. How would you propose, give me one second, I'm sorry. Things just change when you drop the uh, PowerPoint, hang on. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was no worries. I'll have you know. As I always say, PowerPoints for people who don't know how to speak in public. Oh, keynote. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I could just ask the question if you prefer. Ask the question. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. That's even go better. Ahead. 
That's even better. All right. Please. All right. So, uh, Ted, my question is, um, how would you propose a PO's forecast project uh, time boxes while accounting for tech debt that you haven't defined yet? So this is early project stuff, you know, because um, generally we forecast with some with things that we might know potential backlog growth. This is one of those things that we learn along the way. So how would you add some predictability or forecasting into that? Well, you know, um, we are incredibly bad at forecasting the future. We're, 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 we're almost decent at forecasting the past, but the future is always problematic. Um, as my friend uh, Alan Shalloway says, we are all precognitive precognitively disabled. Uh, what I would do, of course, is I would get the folks who are gonna do the work involved. Uh, we're gonna do something over here. It's about like this. What do you think it's gonna be? What do you think it'll take to do this? Uh, the, the best technique I know for coming up with a high level uh, guess at how long it will take to do something is a technique called blink estimation. And bleak estimation works by taking the four, five, six best people, most experienced folks you have sitting around the office. You tell them what it is you propose to do and tell them to think about it for 10 or 15 minutes and come back and tell you what you think, what, what they think it'll take to do it. And it turns out that technique works as well as anything else you can do. And it took five people, 15 or 20 minutes. And so I, I would get people involved and in, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, is it time-based estimation or t-shirt size based estimation? Uh, I, that almost always is, is time and people kind of estimation. If you're talking about it's going to take 20 people 15 months to do this, then that's how you come up with that big number. Uh, if we're talking about, okay, we, we want to make this change and it's going to, is, it, is it a day or two days, talk to the developers. They, they can give you that information probably better than you can. So it's, this is something, you know, like any good agile process, you, you don't do it by yourselves. You get the team involved. And then you measure what happened and learn from that. So that's sure. that's what I would do. So so just to be clear, um, you propose this when we are doing early estimation, say it's sprint zero, because this is the point where- I don't know what sprint zero is, but okay. Okay, it's project initiation, right? So- Call it that then, because it's not yeah, a sprint, so, is it? Right, no, it's- <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, do, yeah, do, get it, start up front, start up front. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question we got here, Chet, um, can you elaborate on why you feel shared services teams work against us? What does that, what does that mean? Why is it at, dis, uh, at disadvantage or frowned upon to have a shared services team that, that handles this type of work? Well, uh, you know, shared services is an approach around if what people see as efficiency. Uh, that way, everybody's always working. And you want to treat it more like the fire department. You don't want the fire department working all the time. You want the fire department available when you need them. And so, so what happens with the shared services type structure is you have folks who are trying to get something done, a development team. And there's something they're not allowed to do, either because they don't have the skill or they don't have the, the permission to do that. And they rely on some other organization, a shared services team. Well, that shared services team almost always, and I don't know, I'm, I, and I, I'm rather uh, uh, doubtful of the almost part of that, that they always have sitting in front of them a big queue of work to make sure they're always busy. And so the thing we need goes into that queue and we have to wait on it, which means we're not working on the most important thing we should be working on. We're working on something that's third or fourth or 15th for us. And those folks are working on things at a completely different cycle of importance. Uh, uh, their priorities are not our priorities. And so, and so we slow down. Every time we deal with one of those things, go slower. We are going, we're, we're, we, we are increasing this, we are decreasing, we are, we are decreasing the speed at which value is being created in order to keep these folks over here busy all the time. And that's just nonsensical when you say it out loud like that. Uh, what you would want to do is have an organization where someone or some bodies are making decisions about priorities. And then as many folks across whatever skills are necessary that, uh, that can 
effectively work on building that highest level of priority, do that. And then if there's people left over, they work on the second highest priority and on and on. Uh, but we don't want to have some team over here working on number 37 just so they can stay busy. Uh, and so shared services just just is a bad just a bad process. Uh, just do a do a value stream analysis in your organization and see how much time things are waiting on somebody else to do something for you, and you'll see how much time is wasted by that. And it's just it's 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 simple queuing theory. It turns out, so yeah, a bad idea. Okay. There's, no math, there's no math that supports it, it turns out. Uh, Angela had a question related to production support site reliability factor and the fact that workarounds are, are kind of a byproduct of that. Do you consider workarounds technical debt or is there something else that you call that? Um, I don't think I've ever thought about that. I think, you know, when you're dealing with that kind of stuff, it's a question of, of organizational structure as well. Do I have one team who is doing running and production support sort of stuff uh, uh, just to keep the lights on? Or have we moved to a true uh, a DevOps kind of approach where the same folks who build things also maintain it and, and, and operate it essentially? That's what DevOps means, one team for this entire, for this product for its entire life cycle. Uh, and so if, uh, however I'm doing that, somebody with the right skill and time should be coming along, making sure that the thing we did in the middle of the night to get the lights back on is remediated properly. And so, and so I would, well, I would want to make sure that anything we had to do in that emergency kind of situation got handled in a better way uh, uh, in the past. Uh, the teams I've worked with over the years, when we had folks doing production support, uh, their job was A, to get it back up and running as quickly as possible and B, fix it right as soon as possible. And so you can either have that done by those folks or pass it back to the folks who, who own the development of the product uh, to do that second, to make sure that that kind of problem never happens again. And that's kind of, you know, an organizational structure. But I would, I would, I would not necessarily consider that, I would not consider that tech debt as long as it was immediately improved. Uh, if that was now the new state of the product, and it would be like that until we have some active reason to change it otherwise, then yeah, that would be tech net. But I would try to put up a situation where any fix, any hot patch that happened at two o'clock in the morning didn't live very long because that's just the thing you did to keep us all from drowning. Uh, but we're gonna fix it right as soon as we can. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of the tech debt or the workarounds that we have, we have over 300 in our applications in pharmacy. And um, unfortunately, those, they linger and linger and then aren't prioritized. But we've been trying to add some value analysis to that to show what our site reliability team is spending on those workarounds every night, every week, every month um, to get those prioritized back through the uh, product backlog. Yeah, and I think I'd probably add some some very high multiplier to things that have to get done more than once. Oh uh, yeah, we put a hot patch in this week, and we have to go in and and hot and patch the patch. Uh, that the 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 impact of that should be an order of magnitude higher than the first one, shouldn't it? Uh, and go on and on and up because we're 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 building something that's going to crumble under our feet fairly soon, and we need to need to be in front of that. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Angela. Good, great question. Uh, Chet, what are some effective techniques to ensuring an organization prioritizes remediation of high value, low effort tech debt um, or to prevent it from happening? To stop digging the hole, right? And not to succumb to pressure to deliver every time, deliver quickly every time. So are there any techniques? I know Angela was talking about uh, making transparent the value proposition there but anything that's worked because it's one of those things that just it's easy to for the organization to say yeah, yeah we know we got tech debt we've got things to deliver you know this isn't impacting customers directly and it doesn't get prioritized what are some techniques that have well, been effective you know, uh, some of that goes that back goes down to the fiber let's call it 
of the engineering staff. Mm -hmm. Because if I am asked to fix something, I have to make some change. Uh, I, of course, you know, I'm a different place in my life than some other folks might be, but I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do the work required to make it how it needs to be. Uh, I've been that way forever, turns out. And I think that's one of the reasons I've prospered in this world is, is that I was not afraid to do the work required to fix a problem once so it stayed fixed and to do quality work. Uh, you should never have to ask permission to do quality work. And so, and so since the people you're working for almost never know what it is you're doing anyway, why not do a good job? And so what? It takes 10% more to do it right. They're never going to notice that. And so, and so do that. Just take it on as a team and say, okay, we're going to start working as if this belonged to us. And we're going to work it the way we want it to be done. And yet in the beginning, it'll take a little bit longer, maybe, maybe. But after a while, it's going to take less and less and less because it'll be easier to make changes. It'll be easier to understand. It'll be easier to, to mold this product to do what you want it to do in the future because of that stuff that we're doing right now. And so it's gonna pay for itself pretty fast. And so, and so I would not ask permission to do quality work. If you're working in a place where you have to ask permission to do quality work, you're probably in the wrong place. Uh, and so, I, I, so yes, we can put things in the organizational level to improve that. But even in the absence of that, I think we should always be able to do good work. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Chet, because it's you put it in terms of if you're being asked to not deliver quality work or asked to compromise. I don't know if that maybe that happens in really bad organizations where it's deliberately asked that way. I'm sure it, it does. But more often than not, it comes as a, a roundabout request. Oh, can we need to do it in this time frame? What can we do? And I think that's where it comes down to the fiber you're talking about of that engineering staff to say, this is what we can deliver with quality based on what we see right here and, um, and, and demand that that's, don't ask permission, just do it. Yeah, you know, and, and I think, you know, this, this, this data I came up with before, here today from, from uh, uh, who are these guys that did this? Uh, Stepwise is the name of the company that did this. You went to stepwise.com, you'll find, a link to down, to get this report, uh, this research they did, and that's a pretty. I think that, that stuff they came up with is fairly compelling uh, to my mind about about the cost people are running up against because of this. Now they they have tools to help remediate uh, tech debt. Um, you know, I don't know whether you need any of those or not, um, but having some numbers that say, "Gee whiz, the average shop is doing this," and I don't see any reason for us to believe we're better than that. Uh, so we're probably in this range someplace. You know, I, one of my favorite pieces of, of data around this that I, I don't remember where it came from. I don't, I don't think I made it up, but I, I saw uh, uh, not too long ago that about half, about, that the average IT shop spends about half their time dealing with defects. And you think about organizations that are squeezed that need to get more stuff done, if you're spending half your time dealing with defects, imagine you cut that by half, how much additional stuff you can get done. Mm -hmm. And defects live, defects live in the dark corners of the code. The things we don't understand are where the bugs are. And so that's where the tech debt is as well, the places that make the code hard to understand. And so you get that and you smooth out those edges, you point light at them, the bugs die. Uh, uh, you know, re refactoring is not about removing bugs, but it turns out when you refactor, you find a lot of bugs and you get rid of them because they're easy to see now. And so all of this stuff gets rid of that huge tax we're imposing on ourselves. You know, yeah, maybe we'll spend a little bit longer over the next six months reducing this overhead. But after that, the world would be a whole lot better and we'll be able to go much faster and much smoother. I think it'll take less time than that. My experience is it'll take less time than that before you start seeing uh, uh, improvement. Uh, but 
imagine it took six months for a system that's going to live for 10 years. It's certainly worth it. Yeah. But it just sounds like it needs to be a very deliberate mindset in the organization um, to really make headway on it. Um, yeah. yeah. We don't have any other questions, and we've got about five minutes left. Were, were there any other questions from the group? We have some great questions coming in here. My wife wants to know when am I going to lunch? <laughs> so. <laughs> soon is the answer. Very, very soon, soon is the answer. Soon is the answer. We already know where we're going. Well, you know, I teach a class on for developers, uh, and so uh, that's a that's a good place to start. Um, there's getting there are a huge number of really good uh, video programs out there uh, written by some great folks. Uh, 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 Brian Beecham does some really great stuff. The folks at Industrial Logic have a wonderful program of online stuff. Uh, G. Paul Hill has videos that are just absolutely incredible, uh, talking about how, how, how to write better code, what things to think about. Uh, he did a lovely talk a while ago around the idea that, that developers do three things with code. Uh, they read it, they change it, they scan it. And scanning code is by far the thing they do the most. And so when we write code, we should optimize for scanning. Scanning is looking through the code, trying to find the spot you're looking for. Then once you find the spot, you read it to figure out what to do, and then you make a change. Optimize for scanning, because that's what you spend the vast majority of your time for doing. So you find things easier. Uh, so interesting stuff. 